Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are around the world. Welcome back to the Light 'em Up Lounge. Welcome to our state of the industry, our quarterly wrap up, um, where we want to discuss and explore in more detail what has been, what will be, and uh, take a glimpse at sort of the, the bigger picture and uh, the meta perspective on the cigar industry and what has happened over the last couple of months and what our perspectives and outlooks for the near future will be. As always on these expert panel shows, we have an incredible array of dear friends and family, special guests joining me today to discuss the state of the industry. And I would love to start with the one and only Javier Blanco Urgiti back at the Light Em Up Lounge. Javier, always a pleasure, a privilege and honor to have you with us. Welcome, my dear friend. Thank you. Thank you, Rehan. It's my, it's my pleasure. Thank you for, for inviting me again to, to take part in this. I think very interesting discussion uh, and uh, uh, with uh, because we, we look at the future with, with uh, we are always optimistic with the future, but we have several worries there and several threats that, that maybe we have to consider. So thank you very much. A very good point. And we'll talk about that and, and much more over the next hour, hour and a half. Um, the next gentleman needs no introduction, a regular, a friend, a mentor of ours, been there from the very beginning, Jose Blanco, the professor. Thank you for joining us, Jose. It's wonderful to see you. The only thing is Jose still hasn't figured how to unmute his microphone. <laughs> You know, because of uh, the dog and Jasper, I, I keep it sometimes. Look, uh, to me, it's a pleasure. Uh, we, when we talked about being this and we talked about Javier and, and having Reinhardt, Reinhold on this. I mean, it's an all-star lineup of people who love the industry, who are passionate about the industry. And we are willing to sacrifice ourselves and this, defend this, this industry with blood, sweat, and tears. So to me, it's an honor to privilege and also to be with a select group of listeners that every week are tuning in that have supported the show and the industry so much. So for me, as we say in Spanish, ha sido un gusto. Es un gusto para mí. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Wonderful. And last but not least on our panel for today, the man behind Cigar Journal, the man who believed in, in our vision uh, for the Light'em Up Lounge and always a most treasured fellow along the journey. Reinhold, thank you for being here with us today. Hello, Reinhold. Hello, everyone. Hello, Jose, Javier. Uh, love to see you all. And uh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And we're going to have a great hour or two. So let's get into it. Absolutely. Jose, before we went live, you actually did a little sort of recap or you, you spoke about a, a show that you've been on yesterday together with, with George Brightman, the, the, the legend, uh, and you spoke about the importance of looking back in time, taking into consideration the rich heritage and the, the history of the premium cigar world. Um, and as I always tend to say, you got to know where you come from in order to know where you're going. What's your current perspective on what's happening in the cigar industry now that we, we, we sort of concluded the first quarter of 22? Um, what an incredible two years it has been ever since the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic hit us all um, out of nowhere. Um, the ups and downs of the industry, um, controversies that we're, we're seeing bubbling up. What's your take on the bigger picture and how do you feel that uh, we as an industry are, you know, prepared for the rest of 2022 now in, in April here? I'm going to have to divide this in two parts because you mentioned something that we had a spectacular show last night. And it's a pity that our friends at the UK Lounge do not uh, record it because George Brightman, which in my opinion is one of the most talented and knowledgeable people in the cigar industry. And I would probably say he's one of the top three palates, I would say, in the States, 
by sure, and maybe one of the te top 10 palettes in the world. So listening to George, Carlito was on the show, I was on the show, Jeremiah on the show, a lot of people. We have forgotten one of the main things. And like I said on one of the shows we did, people don't remember who brought us to the dance. We did a tribute to Carlos Torano. And to be honest, I have to mention my good friend, uh, Ryan Hall, because even though I knew Carlos well, but a lot of the uh, things that I found out of Carlos was a lot of research I did with the magazine, because I think that Ryan uh, Hall had a good relationship with Carlos. But talking about that, we forget about the, the families that sacrificed themselves, that lost it all in Cuba. The Toranos were millionaires. They left with $100 each. One went to Spain, one went to Peru, one went to Dominican, one went to Nicaragua, one went to Honduras. The same thing happened with Benji Menendez. People forget about the sufferings the Placentias went through, the Olivas went through, the Padrons went through, the Fuente went through, and, and so many uh, companies. What Cigars was really about, about the romance and the history, it was what worries me and worries a lot of people, and that we have a group of people, and I believe in freedom of speech, and I believe in innovation, but what I don't believe is in people giving ammunition to the FDA to totally show, uh, shut us down. Our industry has been totally this virtual. We have people that have given their lives, that have sacrificed their lives, entire families that gave it all up to come to different countries to build up this industry. Look what we did in the States last year, 456 million cigars, 30 more million than the boom of 96 and 97. And I know later, we will talk a little bit about that also. So what I'm worried about more than anything else is that. I said it very clear last night. Do we need more manufacturers? Absolutely not. Do we need more retailers? Absolutely not. Do we need better manufacturers? Yes. Do we need more re better retailers? Yes. Do we need consumers that are more educated, retailers more educated, salespeople that are more educated, distributors that are more educated? Yes. Because when all that goes into play, it's easier for a retailer to sell to a consumer, a consumer to uh, interact with the retailer and the retailer to interact with the salesman and the salesman to interact with the company. So it's all about education. And I have to say, this show and many other shows has been very, very important. And I firmly believe it has to do a lot with the growth that the industry has had. Who would have thought with a pandemic, with millions of, of lives lost, billions of, of wealth lost, that our industry would be so strong, so proper, prosperous. And still, I believe that the best is still yet to come. And we certainly hope so and believe so. Javier, what, what's your take on, on things? When, when you take that meta position and look at the industry holistically with everything that, that has happened over the past couple of months and um, looking into the future for 2022, what's your take? Well, I absolutely agree with Jose about uh, the, the importance of the memory uh, in the industry. And everything in, in the cigar world is related with the memory. So that's very important, including the taste, the taste of, the, of the tobacco is related with memory. So that's very important. And I forget from, from where we come. Um, but uh, I think that nobody Two years ago, before the pandemic, no, no, nobody expected really what was going to happen. Nobody was expecting for this boom in the demand. And now the discussion in the industry is about if this is only a boom that will pass or if it's a boom that is, will stay. I think that's very important because it's not the same to make cigars that make, uh, I don't know, anything else, cars or anything else. For cigars, time is very important. Uh, the, the, the growing, the tobacco that is growing now is not for this year, it's maybe for two years, three years or four years ago. So we, uh, we need in the industry, the industry need a, a good forecast of what is going to happen with the market. 
um, and and to go step by step and you know very carefully because um, uh, it is not the same uh, if the boom stays or if the boom pass uh, that that happens in the 90s and a lot of companies that jose will remember uh, uh, bro uh, broke down because uh, that uh, that was too much production and not so so much uh, demand. So this is for for me this is the real uh, key for for the future that we will see in 2022. And uh, if in 2023 this demand is going to stay or is going to pass, uh, because uh, the things that the decisions that the industry is are, are making now are not for now are for two or three or four years so for me this is the this is the key and, and um, uh, in the future and uh, the other thing are all the problems that uh, are new for the industry uh, that have to do with this uh, big de demand that, that 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 we live today that of course it is a uh, it's very good because uh, suddenly you, you see that the sales are growing, that people, uh, despite of the FDA or of all the authorities, the health authorities in all the countries, people is smoking. That and that for that the memory is very important because uh, you know 20 years ago uh, there was uh, ads for tobacco everywhere and uh, there were no these um, pictograms. There, there was nothing of this, and um, 20 years uh, after, with all this legislation, with all these bans, people still smoke. So someone <laughs> should reconsider the health politics in in, in the administration. But um, I, I mean, uh, this this big demand uh, is not only in tobacco; it's in all the products that we need for tobacco, like food, like paper. The logistics. Uh, we didn't expect two years ago that the logistics were going to be so difficult in, in after the pandemic and so expensive. And uh, of course, uh, the, all this this trouble, all these uh, problems, at the end goes to the pocket of the consumer because uh, you know uh, no nobody is going to to give the, the cigars for free or under the the, the price of cost. No. For me, these are, these are the challenges, the two most important challenges for, for next year. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I, I would love to invite all of our viewers, and there's many over on Facebook um, joining us at the moment, uh, watching this, this expert panel. If you have questions, in particular for Jose, for Javier or Reinhold, then please make yourselves heard, put your questions into the comments underneath the live stream. I'm always checking over there so that I can forward your questions to our panel and we can include your questions in this important conversation and discuss all this. Javier, you, you made some excellent points. Um, one of them in particular being that whilst in the 90s, the, the big cigar boom was primarily a US phenomenon, today what we see is a, is a tremendous rise in demand all across the globe. It has become a worldwide phenomenon. And if I may say, not the least because of the efforts of, of Reinhold and Cigar Journal and, and, and other media outlets there, singing the gospel and sharing the, the wonderful world of handmade premium cigars with international audiences. So Reinhold, what, what is your, um, your perspective on this, when looking back at um, you know some similarities and parallels, but then also the differences between what has happened in the '90s and that huge demand that we're currently seeing with the global market. Um, well, there are so many aspects to that. Um, I have to concentrate on a few. Um, <clears throat> first of all, what goes up has to come down. We we will see that. That's no question in my mind. Um, I'm happy that a boom is happening right now, uh, and I'm glad for the industry, I'm glad for the consumer, I'm glad for the manufacturers, the distributors, and so forth. But there are so many downsides as well that we have to take into consideration. First of all, let me point out, I think that the boom in the 90s was very different than the boom that we have now. In the 90s, 
everybody was grabbing a cigar and had no clue what they're doing. It was just a uh, to show yourself with a cigar in a, in a cigar bar or in any bar. Back then, smoking was allowed in most places. Uh, people had really no clue about cigars, not much. Uh, it was hip uh, to have a cigar, to show yourself with a cigar. But today, and remember the numbers are higher today uh, with the imports into the US than they were uh, in the 90s. Today, we're dealing with a lot, lot more of educated uh, cigar smokers. So I think that this boom is on a different level than the boom of the 90s. And I'm happy for that because uh, a lot more people know a lot more things about cigars. Um, uh, that's the one thing. The, the other thing is, um, co in comparison uh, to the boom of the 90s, uh, I, I, I do see some um, uh, quality issues in this boom already. Not as bad as in the 90s, though, I have to say. Uh, but there are some issues. I mean, people are rushing. People have problems with logistics, with manufacturing, with boxes, with tobacco, with workers, with rollers, with farming, uh, and so forth. So uh, yes, the demand is high. Uh, there are some quality issues arising, uh, but Again, not as bad as in the 90s. In the 90s, we had more shit on the market uh, that, uh, than we can ever imagine today. Fortunately, uh, the cigars are still good. Uh, but of course, as always, there are some people that want to take advantage uh, and, and think they could make a quick buck uh, and they put out cigars that are not worth it. Um, in, in general, I, I'm optimistic, as probably you all are, uh, about the cigar industry, but we do have to face the same challenges uh, as always. Our biggest enemies are legislation, um, regulation, and taxes. Uh, and with the price hike that's going on right now, due to price increases in all sectors of all industries, uh, I think cigars might be getting very expensive. Um, and then when the taxation jumps in and legislation jumps in and regulation with more fees to even um, register a brand in Europe, in the US, in wherever, uh, this is gonna hurt a lot of people um, not only financially, but I believe it's uh, logis administratively, it's, it's, it's a big, big thing. It's a lot of work, a lot of paper, paperwork. Uh, and uh, if, in, let's say in Europe, with the track and trace, someone has not prepared yet, they might be in trouble in two years. So that's about my perspective for now. Reinhardt, excuse me a minute. I have to make a point, something very interesting that Reinhardt said. Yes, there is a big difference between the boom of 96 and 97. And we have to look at it that 96, 97, especially 97, it was a phenomenal, basically in the United States where we hit 418 million. You had a little bit of fever in the rest of the world but not like the fever we have worldwide. And everything both that Javier and Ryan, uh, Reinhold said will impact the industry. Now, one thing, and I think I had this conversation with Reinhardt, uh, I know I had it with Reinhardt before, but I think I had it with Reinhold when I was uh, at Austria a couple of months ago, is that if you look at the boom of 96, 97, what was the number one selling size? It was a Robusto, five by 50. Then you have Coronas, they were five and a quarter by 42. You had some Churchills and that. Now you have the number one selling size in the United States is total in the last five years, six by 54. Then you have Robustos that could be 
five by 50, five and a quarter by 52, even five and a half by 54, consider a robusto, and then you have a six by 60. We estimate that 60, uh, uh, 38 to 40% more tobacco has been used in making the 456 million. So my question, and I've asked this to uh, private conversation with people on our show, that's what worries me the most. Where is all this tobacco to make 456 million? And the other thing, and I agree with Rhino completely, 70 to 80, I would say 70% of the cigars in the boom were shit. And I would say now, I would say 75 to 80 are good, smokable, even though we're seeing already some companies cutting corners and we're not going to mention. If we make less and continue to make them better, we will have another great year. But if we start cutting corners, the history repeats itself and will happen. What will happen again is what happened in 1997. My two cents. I think I think there's another another difference, another important difference between the '90s and and now, yeah, and it has to do with the social media, and with people like like Ryan Hart too, and the very good work that he has been doing for these two last uh, this in these last two years with Light and Up and people like like him, um, that. Uh, at least in Spain, that is the country where I move more and that I know more, that there's a lot of young people coming into the tobacco world. And uh, young people that is coming in, uh, comes uh, with, uh, they, they feel like knowing more, they come with inky to, they, they, they want to learn, they want to try, they come open-minded. And there's a lot and lots and lots of young people Coming in, so this is this is why I, I said that in the beginning that I, I want to look to to the future with uh, uh, the, in an optimistic way, uh, because uh, these young people is of course is uh, is the future, but not only young people because uh, the, uh, I, you know I, I come into the tobacco world working for the magazines in 1998. In, in 1998, uh, in Spain, in Europe in general there was not a woman smoking a cigar, not one. But now you can see lots of them. Every time more women coming into the tobacco world. And this, these two things, uh, you know, make me feel that uh, probably this boom is, is very, different to, very different to the nineties. To and not only because they are young, and, uh, but because they, they come with a, with a critic uh, spirit that is very good for the industry too. People that uh, uh, want to learn, want to, to know what is good to difference and to, to be critic with the, with the industry. So uh, probably, uh, I don't like the word shit, but, <laughs> but uh, probably these, these uh, cigars have uh, less chance that in, in the nineties, not that it was more maybe a fashion with uh, with uh, cinema stars and singers and some governors to of a state in, in the United States smoking cigars. Of course, this is very good, no. But I think now it have this this base of young people that maybe feel that that this is going to be for long. Mm-hmm. Reinhold, you, with, with the tasting panio at Cigar Journal, you probably have a, a unique perspective of so many different uh, reviewers and, uh, and people evaluating all blindly, we have to say, evaluating the, the cigars for the magazine. Um, how troublesome is it for you or, or, or how worried are you when when you think about those um, those issues that you mentioned? Uh, certain drops in quality. Jose mentioned uh, companies cutting corners. How big of a concern is that for you? And do you think that's only going to get worse, or could we reach a point where the the industry as a whole sort of comes to reason and says, "Look, this is what we got to do. We got to make it right." And for the better of the entire industry, let's focus on quality and nothing else. Uh, again, two points. 
Um, I have no issues with any of the established uh, brands. Uh, I, at least I have not seen any downside in quality, uh, any decrease in quality. Uh, those guys, uh, you know all the big brands, they, they know what to look for and what to look out for. Uh, there's, there's no issue. Um, with with the, all the, the private labels and the, the many new brands that are out there, I, we noticed in our tastings a little bit um, that, that people are cutting corners, people are having problems with the tobacco, uh, they might, you know, they might source tobacco from other uh, companies than they used to. I don't know what they do, uh, but um, yes, there are there are issues because you know factories were closed, factories are not at their at their uh, capacity that they used to be. Overall, I have to say I'm I'm not worried. I'm I'm especially not worried for all the established brands because they have learned their lessons 30 years ago. Uh, but the new ones that come in and think they can uh, jump on the wagon right now and make a quick buck and, 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 and be in the, in the industry and, and earn money um, with... Nowadays, cigar smokers that know a lot it's not going to happen. They're going to be gone soon. So no, I'm not worried. Do you think that um, this is primarily a an issue on, on behalf of, of the brand owners? Because as you said, they might uh, you know, be, be inclined to jump on the bandwagon or, or try to, to use the opportunity now to, to get into the business. Or could it also be that because they so heavily depend on manufacturers supplying them with the right material and giving them enough time or, or you know space within their production run and the, the capacity of um, of the tabacalera that it's just the sheer nature of how things are that you know all the large manufacturers they will primarily focus on their own brands first then their biggest accounts in terms of private labels and then it's sort of the leftovers for, for all the other smaller guys. Now, listen, I mean, you have, you have uh, small, call it boutique factory, uh, manufacturers that, uh, that focus totally on the quality of the cigar. Uh, you know all the, all the names. Uh, and they, they are not shy of spending the money that they need to spend to get the tobacco that they really like to produce the cigar that they have in mind. I don't worry about those. I, I'm worried about those who say, okay, I'm gonna be in the cigar industry and I buy any tobacco or I make compromises now because everything is expensive, logistics prices went up, everything went up, um, shipping went up, uh, and then they spend less than they intended to on the tobacco. And here, the, you know, the whole train goes down the trail. Uh, so that's, that's my concern. But again, this is not the established producer. This is not uh, the, the people that we know are geeks in the industry, they are searching for tobacco that's whatever, aged. Uh, it's, it's other people that, that want to make a quick buck. Yeah. There's, one thing, there's one thing, if I can say, uh, I'm, I'm sure Jose is going to agree with me totally, uh, that some, sometimes it's not that the brands are cutting corners, as you say, it's, it's, the only thing is that there is no tobacco. 
no tobacco, not enough tobacco for all. Is the, the first thing I, I said about the forecast when, when you grow tobacco, you grow it to use it in two or three years. So uh, nobody was expecting this boom. And now there's, there's, there's no tobacco. So unless you are a big brand and you have a warehouse full of bales, the big brands that have bales for five, six years to maintain the consistency of their, of their cigars, and then maybe you can respond to the demand. But if you try to respond to the demand now, all the big demand, maybe you are not, you're going to run out of tobacco and you're not going to have tobacco for, for next year. Maybe you have to change your consistency. Or if you don't grow your own tobacco, you, you, you depend on, your, on the market. You have to go to the, to the, to the tobacco market to buy your, your, your tobacco for your cigars then uh, maybe you, you cannot find the tobacco you need or you have to pay much more for the same tobacco to maintain your consistency. So this is a very, uh, very big difficult for, for boutique brands and, and little brands. And, and for some, some big brands, uh, one, one of the things I think is happening with the Cuban cigars is probably this, that they don't have enough tobacco to respond to the demand that they have. And if they don't have the tobacco, they, they cannot do more tobaccos here in, in Spain, I don't know, in other countries in Europe, there, there's a lack of abanos in the in the retail shop. We have very, very, very little. There, there's no, no abanos at all. So uh, maybe it's not cutting corners, maybe it's that there's not enough uh, leave for, for, for this big demand. Uh... When we, when we say, and I think maybe that's what uh, <clears throat> Ryan Hall is uh, referring to, at least when I talk about cutting corners, one thing is you have a shortage of tobacco, but cutting corners to me is that all of a sudden you're using tobacco that are three or four years. In 2020, you ate up half your inventory. In 2021, you ate the rest of your inventory that was supposed to be for four years because you were making 30,000 cigars a day. Now you're making 70. So when I refer to cutting corners is that already you're using tobacco, X, Y, Z type of tobacco that was four years old. And all of a sudden, because you ran out of tobacco, you're using tobacco that's a year old. So that cigar, I don't care who the master blender is, cannot perform and make that blend the same as it was before when he was using tobaccos that were three or four years old. And that's what, without mentioning brands again, that's what I'm hearing for so many people, even from some good middle-sized companies, that they take the cigar and they take the foot of the cigar and they pick up the ammonias. And what I've been saying for more than two years since we started to see this madness, make less, continue with quality and not quantity, and this will go on for a long time. That is my biggest concern, because why? History repeats itself. A, a general question that Alistair posted on Facebook is um, regarding farming, um, the primings, grading of the tobacco, blending and rolling. Um, do you all think that these skills are improving or declining or just about keeping up with demand? And um, he also mentioned, um, do you think that the price of labor will be a substantial problem going forward? <sighs> Because I'm the oldest, I'm going to address this. I think I'm the oldest in the room. If not, somebody can take my place. Uh, look, we know, for sure, we know for a fact that labor in all the countries except Cuba, unfortunately, <laughs> have gone up through the roof. Dominican, Honduras, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Brazil, uh, Colombia, Mexico, everywhere labor has gone up. The cost of living has gone up. The cost of tobacco has gone up. Last year, beginning of the year, you were buying Ligeros from Esteli uh, for filler. They're around $750 to $850. The year finished 
at 10 and 1050 a pound. And to be honest, even though some companies had dramatically huge increases, other companies didn't have them. To be honest, I would say that the uh, price increase from the majority of the companies were justified. And to be honest, some were very low. Plus, a container that used to come to Europe that used to cost eight or ten thousand dollars, it's around twenty-four to twenty-five thousand dollars. Look at the prices of gas. Look at the prices of, of of food in the states. The United States has the highest inflation in the last forty years, and we don't know where it's going to stop. Plus, you have a country that's totally divided, so it's going to keep growing. Cost of labor, cost of fertilizer cost of paper, cost of bands, cost of wood, cost of glue, cost of everything. To be honest, and I'm not because I'm part of the industry, I think personally that the uh, the increases of uh, uh, on the cigars were pretty uh, uh, moderated. I would not be surprised that towards maybe the mid-year or last quarter of the year, we'll see price increases again if this worldwide crisis if everything continues. That's my personal opinion as Jose Blanco, not as a member of Fuente or Marafel. Jose, let me, let me ask a follow-up question that um, Macy, our dear friend, uh, just posted on, on Facebook as well. Um, he was curious um, whether there are any sort of undeveloped or emerging areas that you believe are promising for premium tobacco leaf cultivation moving forward. Um, he mentioned that his wife is from Colombia, for example, and, and he would assume that there might be certain regions and areas that could grow excellent tobacco, if, at least in that. parts of the country. Ooh, so ooh. do you think there is some um, potential for, uh, you know, new emerging um, origins of, of tobacco or even skilled labor where cigars could be manufactured in order to take some of that stress away from the, the, the big well-known um, areas in, in the DR, Nicaragua, Honduras? Listen, uh, my cousin Javier mentioned Cubita. Cubita has been around for years. Yeah, Taidona. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the most inexpensive uh, tobaccos out there. Some companies use a little bit on really premium stuff, but the majority of people that I've seen working with it, that they use it a lot for more, for bundles and more economical cigars. Look, one of the things that I always tell all the companies, whether it's Universal, the Placentias, the Olivas, whoever it is, to try to experiment in different countries. But take my word, the majority of those big countries, companies have tried it in different countries. They're always experimenting. I used to receive a La Aurora from different countries that I even never heard of to try. And to be honest, they were okay, but nothing like producing Dominican or Cuba or Nicaragua, or Honduras or Ecuador or Mexico, even a little bit from Costa Rica. I wish, I know some people, friends of mine have tried to grow a little bit of tobacco in Africa outside of Cameroon but the results have not uh, been that good. India is producing a lot of tobacco leaf from, from India. It's coming. They, they use it for, for machine-made cigars, of course, but there's a lot of tobacco from India. But 20 years ago, we, uh, we knew about the Tairona tobacco, uh, Cubita, and it's used in some premium cigars too. I, I, I think that Vega Fina, he used Cubita in, in his first plant in the class in Pegafina. And in La Aurora, I work in La Aurora too, like Jose. And in La Aurora, we use it. We, we use Cubita. And I, I know um, Nestor Placencia is growing tobacco in Panama too, making some trials. Uh, Macanudo made this trial with, with Jamaica, with tobacco from, from Jamaica. That was a kind of strange tobacco, looked like a, a blunt tobacco look like a ruby. I don't know if the, the word in English is blunt tobacco, mm -hmm. uh, tobacco for cigarettes. But they use it in that um, Jamaica state, Macanudo, Jamaica state. They use it tobacco from Jamaica. I think the possibilities are, you know, uh, one or one year and a half ago, I make an interview to Ernesto Perez Carrillo, for me, one of the masters in, in tobacco world. 
And he told me that he passed the, the lockdown in his house in, in Miami, making some trials. And the conclusion that he had is that we only know more or less a 15% of the possibilities that, of course, I say, if you, if you Ernesto Bencarrillo, only know the 15% of the possibilities, me, Javier Lancurguetti, only know 1.15% uh, of the possibilities. No? But this made me feel, made me think that, that the possibilities are, are, are brilliant. But for the future, because uh, again, with the same, with the, with the problem of the, of the forecast and, and, the, and about the inflation that, what, what, Jose Blanco has said, uh, one thing that, that is um, the price is growing is in, the, is in tobacco and it's normal because uh, there's a lot of new brands, a lot of um, new brands coming into the markets, uh, brands of new creation that they need tobacco and they don't grow, they buy it in the markets. And uh, of course, uh, this makes the, the price uh, the, the grow, it's, it's impossible to stop it. Reinhold, I'm, I'm curious. I, I, I know for a fact that um, you um, had spoken to, to various different uh, entities and, and the professionals in, in China also. And I think we, we, we also need to address that uh, elephant in the room. Um, how do you think that uh, this particular market um, will affect what, what's happening as well? And then when we, when we talk about uh, specific uh, origins of tobacco, um, could China also be, uh, be an area to take into consideration there? Um, in the long run, probably. Uh, I know for a fact, and so do you, that um, China is trying to produce cigars and tobacco for years and years and years and years without or with no much success. Um, they keep on sending us samples. And I have to say that the workmanship of these cigars is unbelievable. It's really, I mean, wow. Uh, the tobacco plants are, is something different. I mean, the cigars that they produce with Nicaraguan, Dominican, uh, Honduran, uh, tobacco, they are fine. Uh, whenever you have China tobacco in there, yeah, you, you don't really want to smoke that. Also, I mean, their, their knowledge about, of, of, of growing tobacco is, is not yet there, but we know the Chinese and they, they, uh, they keep trying and trying and trying and copying and copying until they make it. Um, and I'm sure they will, at one point, uh, be able to do a decent crop of tobacco. Um, I can only tell you that the cigars that, that we get, usually from Great Wall Cigars, um, are at times really good, really good. Uh, the tobacco, probably not. Jose, we, you mentioned the, the aspect of unity before and uh, how we can, we can now with, uh, with the stress that is being put on the ecosystem, you know, certain controversies bubble up, certain discrepancies start to emerge. And yet we, we as an industry always pride ourselves of the family, the brotherhood and the sisterhood of the leaf. Um, do you think we, we all need to, to come closer together in order to solve those problems because we cannot deal with it at an individual level? Um, and, and do we need a more consolidated effort in order to move forward? And um, I, I would also like to, to sort of tie in the question from, from Mark over on Facebook, um, where he said that there has been some discussions on, on various different platforms and shows about initiating a round table format for manufacturers, developing a core set of, you know, being either practices, uh, best practices, or just shared definitions of goals and messages, and ultimately what, uh, what the premium cigar industry is supposed to do. <clears throat> Listen, <clears throat> we've talked in various uh, discussions and we've looked at other industries, the liquor industry, you know, the vodkas, the whiskeys, the rums, the beers. 
they auto-regulate themselves. We have been an industry that for a while, it's been like the wild. For a while, it was, even though it wasn't regulated, but if you look at the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, even 2010, up to 2015, we were all doing things correct. Now it's like the Wild West. Uh, pop, uh, 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 10 cigars in, in a popcorn box, uh, Hershey bars. I'm surprised that Mars and Hershey hasn't gone off these guys. Cookie creams, ice creams, all these things. I, like I said before, I believe in innovation, but we have to have regulation. We have to auto-regulate ourselves. There's a lot of new newcomers that have done a fantastic job. I don't want to mention, because if I forget one, but we know at least three or four guys that in the last five years have really done quality product. They're out there. Their brands are selling. They're respectful. But you have a whole bunch of people that have joined in, like, oh, this is a fad, and they're making anything up. Pizza, popcorns, The Simpsons, all that stuff, all things that could just is ammunition and bullets for the uh, for the FDA. That's what really has me pissed off and has me worried up at night. And the other thing is, I do agree, but the problem with this, Reinhardt, is that everybody has their own agenda. There's only very few companies that really have an agenda. And I'm not saying this because I work with Carlito and Jeremiah. If there's been someone that has preached for years for unity, that has wanted new people in the industry, new entrepreneurs, people with innovation, but people at the same time with respect for the industry and respect for those who brought us to the dance. I wish we could all get together and agree. The PCA is going to have to play a big role on this upcoming show. And I think I haven't been in Dortmund in years, but I got to tell you one thing, the, 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 uh, the ice cream cones and the munchies and the Hershey bars and that stuff, still, I have not seen it in Europe. I have not seen that on Instagram. I have not seen it in shows. So my hat's off to all our good friends in Europe and the rest, and the rest of the world. But in the States, it's becoming a joke. And these people are the people that are going to bring down the industry. And let me tell you one thing. Companies like us and Padrons and La Aurora and Perdomos and the Pepins of the world and the Pete Johnsons and the Sakas and all these people who have done it correct will not suffer. But all these people that have come up with all this gimmicky Mickey Mouse stuff, I can tell you, those are the first companies that the FDA will put out of business and we will also all pay for that too with lawyers, taxation, smoking bans, and they're going to hit us left and right, left and right, left and right, if we do not stop this uh, ridiculous thing. So I think that uh, my cousin Javier and Reinhold, of course, have something to say about this also. Well, well said, Jose, and, uh, and uh, I absolutely agree with you. What we have to teach our readers, the consumers, is please stay away from that stuff. Uh, condemn it. Uh, talk to your friends and, and, and make them know we don't want to touch this, that, that Mickey Mouse stuff, as you call it, rightfully so. Uh, it's, it's a disgrace. And, uh, and as you said, they will hurt us. They will hurt the industry uh, if, we, if we let them go on with that or anyone lets them go on with that. Uh, we will hurt because FDA and all the regulators uh, will look at the big picture and say, okay, tobacco industry again. Um, so we cannot let that go on. Yeah, totally right. And there's two. Uh, there, there's two kinds of industry in tobacco, uh, and uh, uh, one of the very important things that I always say is to make understand politicians 
that one thing is cigarettes and one thing is cigars is very different. Although everything is tobacco, of course, but are very different products made in a different way that come from very different industries that goes to very different consumers that are used in a very different way. And for me, it's like comparing a tomato soup with ketchup that of course both come from tomato, but they are very different. And that is one thing that maybe, maybe we don't have to blame any, anyone outside the industry, but the proper industry blame them because I don't know why uh, this industry have mm, not mm, the impulse of coming all together to defend their own interests. And one of the first interests of the cigar industry is to separate clearly from cigarettes industry. That's key because politicians and health authorities, they don't come for cigars, they go for cigarettes. And in the same back, we are all together. So uh, of course, I, I don't mean that uh, if we achieve this, separate clearly both industries, uh, we are going to be free to smoke everywhere. Of course, we are not going back a step. We are, we, we are not reconquering any space, uh, fortunately, but at least for the future, for the future bans and for the future difficulties. For, for example, Rifle has mentioned track and trace. This track and trace, this is crazy. This is not for cigars. This is for cigarettes. This is uh, for counterfeiting and for smuggling cigarettes, not for cigars. And somebody have to explain the politicians and the lawmakers and the uh, uh, and uh, the guys in parliaments that uh, we are the very different worlds, very different worlds, and uh, this this is one thing that have to come from uh, in inside the industry. They, they they have to be the producers. They they have to be then the, the big brands that sit together around the table and pull apart their difference, and of course they have a lot of difference as competitors, and put together their interests to, 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 to defend them, and of course defend their consumers. And uh, I don't know why this, this, this is not done. Uh, we, we had different uh, attempts, but at the end, uh, you know, is the, the effect, you, you cannot see it. <clears throat> Let, let me just add one thing, Javier. Um, in, in my honest opinion, I strongly believe that politicians are not able to differentiate tobaccos. Um, whenever I talk to politicians, and I do that quite often, uh, I have, you know, I try to educate them. They have no clue what the difference is between a cigar and a cigarette. Tobacco for them is tobacco. Uh, and we have actually failed um, educating those guys uh, in the differentiation uh, of, of the two very different products. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot give up. Uh, and we should not give up. Um, and that's why CRA and CRE, Cigar Rights of Europe and America, um, uh, set up the Enjoy a Cigar Day on May 31, just to focus on the differentiation between the two products. Uh, we still have to teach people a lot about that. Uh, politicians are not willing or not able to understand that there's a difference, but we still have to go on and do that. Our dear friend Gabby Caffey um, just mentioned on Facebook something that I, I think is very important and, and very interesting. Um, he first of all applauds all of you for for speaking the truth and and, and sending out such a positive message here. And uh, he he said that the fact uh, this discussion is happening is because we we all care for the future of the industry, which we we certainly do and we do so from heart. 
um, he said on meetings with the FDA, the Department of Health, Human Services, uh, as well as the National Academies of Science. And, um, and, and Gabby said that um, they don't care about putting us out of business, but it is our responsibility to care for our own industry and our own businesses. And that now more than ever, we all need to come together. Um, and I, I, I certainly agree with that. What, what I'm curious about though, and it might be tough to answer, but uh, I want to hear your opinion, especially with what um, was said from, from Mark about the round table idea. Do you honestly think that the industry and, and the key players of the industry are even willing and capable of putting something like this together, creating that sense of unity and speaking with one voice? Or will it ultimately lead to more of a survival of the fittest where um, we need to hit the wall first and, and, and we need to see dramatic changes and downturns for the entire industry for certain people to wake up, then take action and try to somehow secure what's, what's left? I mean, what, what's your honest take on that? Look, I, I firmly believe, and I hope I don't leave anybody out, you, look, People like uh, Jorge Padron, Carlito Fuente, Nick Perdomo, Pete Johnson, uh, Ernesto, the people of Hoya, many, many, many of the main players, I don't think they have a problem. They might have slight differences. They might not agree on this, might not agree on that. But I think that the main players, the people that produce the majority of cigars would name would be willing to sit down. I don't have anything against these small players. The problem with these small players, especially the people that are making up all these in crazy cigars, those people will never sit on the table. First, they're going to say that they have the rights to do it. They'll preach out for the First Amendment. They'll preach out uh, for a free business, that they're entrepreneurs, that they're this. That, that small segment of people are the people that will never be willing to sit down because they're all, it's like the Wild West for them. They're all mavericks. Some of them even think they know them more, they know more than from all of us that have been all our lives in the business. So that's my greatest fear is some of those, of these loose cannons that are out there. I think the main players, even the big companies, that don't go to the PCA anymore, would be willing and able to sit down to clarify some things. But there's a group of people, look, I've been around for a long time. I've been in the dance for a long time. There's some of those people that just hate the PCA and they hate the big players, the people who have been successful, the people that have made this industry that we love so much possible that's that's my my thoughts on that i think it's not only a question of good intentions uh, good relations with, with with within computer competitors that are I, i know they have very good relations uh, it's a question of money so if you want to make a lobby that works you have to put money on the table that's the way it works putting money and uh, making a very good campaign and not 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 trying to involve the consumer because at the end we, we cannot uh, lie ourselves we are interested in tobacco world because we are in tobacco world and all our lives comes around tobacco at least my life from the morning to to, to the night comes around tobacco but the consumer at the end doesn't care that is that's the truth the the only moment that they, they worry about the ban is when they sit in a table in a restaurant and they want to smoke and they, they cannot because it's, it's prohibited. So in that moment, they complain. They say, ah, we cannot smoke anywhere. Where are we going? Where, what about freedom? But in the following 10 minutes, he has forgot that. So uh, it's, not, it's not their problem. The problem is in the industry. And that kind of problems, you know, uh, I've been working for, for the lobby here in Spain for long years. And uh, a lobby works if you, if you put money in the table, good intentions, if you 
um, have good ideas and if you put money in and you make a good campaign long in time long in time dropping like uh, you know little rain little rain dropping looking at the future and uh, involving as much people as you can of course in the industry but uh, with a professional there's a there's a lobby working in in Europe there's the ECMA, the European uh, Cigar Manufacturers Association. The, the lobby is done, is well, but the, 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 they are in the, in the hands of the of the machine made, uh, uh, you know, the cigarillos. Uh, but they work. They, they they have their office in Brussels. They they do it. And this is this is about not only good intentions. It's, a, it's about money doing it. When you look at it, I mean, uh, we've mentioned PCA several times. Uh, PCA took a big hit uh, with with uh, some companies not being willing to exhibit anymore at the show, um, going to PPE and and, uh, and and pulling off their money from from the PCA table. Um, this has already been a separation, a big separation. Uh, in the industry, um, which, yeah, it's unfortunate for the PCA. It's probably not so bad for the industry as a whole, for, for the premium industry. Um, and uh, and this, they're pretty much the same, Tadja, if you remember, pretty much the same was going on in Europe with the ICMA. Uh, they, they were about to push out one of the big players because he produces uh, cigarillos with homogenized uh, tobacco. Um, it's, I don't know if we can ever solve this problem. Uh, it's uh, people looking at the tobacco industry from different sides. Uh, I strongly believe the premium cigar industry should set themselves apart from anything else. Um, I strongly believe that, uh, but it's obviously very hard. I don't know what you think, think Jose. It, 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 it's not being done yet. No, and, and to be honest, uh, we keep forgetting that we are uh, a little bit over a, a billion, I think, altogether. The vape industry started 10 or 12 years ago. It's bigger than us. The mass market between Black and Mile, Philly Blunts, Swisher Sweets, and all that, the rest of that stuff is 13.7 billion cigars. So uh, I hate to say it, but there's uh, even some of the big companies have the mass market, which is where they really make all their money. And uh, they have a little bit of the uh, premium side. If you look at General Cigars, the Scandinavian look of Altavis, look all the stuff they do with Philly Blunts alone. I think it's 2.7 uh, backwards and, and all that stuff and the mass market. So really, uh, it, it's an uphill battle. And that's why I said before, Reinhardt, that, you know, everybody has their own agenda and, uh, you know, Part of the problem that a lot of manufacturers do not belong to the CAA is because the CAA is more focused and where they get their money is from the mass market. And that's why so many manufacturers are not members of the CAA anymore because all the efforts of the CAA was protecting the mass market. Reinhardt, to be honest, it's, it's a bit complicated. And I agree with Reinhold, it's not so easy to solve We've tried to talk, but there's too much interest in there. Now, if you were to put together like the family owned companies and you would separate them from uh, the big corporations, then that's a different thing. But still, you're only getting a piece of the pie because to be honest, it's a big pie, but the premium side of it, it's just a slice of the big pie. Does that ultimately mean that the future of the of the premium industry then 
rests on on the shoulders of you know the regulatory entities to to come up with that uh, with that clear definition of what a premium cigar is and and how it should be treated differently well you know that that i i, I think if i'm not mistaken i think that uh, definition and that uh final uh definition i still it's in court i think something's coming up in may where they're going to talk about it. But, you know, one thing, and look, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, when you see the people, whether it's a state senator, a U.S. senator, or a congressman, or any part of the world, they see tobacco. They don't understand a cigarette from pipe, from mass market, and all that. And that is the problem that we have. When I used to go, I used to be on the advisory committee for the RTDA at this time was going week after week to Congress, to the Senate, to explain to them the difference between cigarettes, mass market, and cigars. I remember I was in Senator Texter's office one time, talking with him and the chief of staff, and I asked him, do you have an idea how much the cigar industry is? And at that time, it was maybe 700, 800 million. He didn't have an idea. And I asked him, do you know how big the cigarette industry is? And I think the senator said, yeah, maybe 35 or 30, 40 billion. I said, double it. <laughs> it's around $90 billion. I'm talking about that time. It has declined because, to be honest, the vape uh, industry has taken a lot to it. But still, the cigarette industry is 40 or 50 times bigger than us. It's a complicated situation. Oh, yeah. It was 15,000 euros in taxes here in Spain uh, a year. 15,000 euros in, in, in taxes. I think it's... Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can say, Jose, and it's very true that the cigar industry, the premium cigar industry, is tiny beside the big tobacco. And that's why I think the, we, we have more need uh, to split it clearly. And one thing that is very important, that I think that the politicians may understand this, that the importance that have the, the premium cigar industry in the countries of origin, they, that, that is key to, to make them understand that, for example, in cities like Esteli, if it wasn't for uh, because of tobacco industry, that, that city uh, wouldn't be possible the way it's like now, or Santiago de los Caballeros, um, the importance that the cigar industry has in the economics of these countries that you know, are, are in in developed uh, way or underdeveloped. You know, Nicaragua is, I think, the second country poorest in, in America. Uh, the importance of cigar industry in Nicaragua is tremendous. And when the politicians, they, they you know, they, they feel the, the, their speeches with the solidarity with these countries, with the help, with the brotherhood, with this with this country, and at the same time, they are putting all the barriers they can, um, without sense, if I can say this, without uh, logic, uh, to the one of the main products that they, they export. So I think when, when you talk to the politicians in this kind of terms, they, they understand more than when we talk about the family, the tradition, the product. Uh, that's very good for, for, for insight. And for the consumers, but for the stakeholders, maybe uh, you need a study of the importance of cigar, premium cigar industry in the economics of these countries. Let me please add something to that. Uh, it, it, it's probably not really relevant anymore, but <clears throat> at least we have tried for several years to bring the, the premium cigar producing countries together and uh, push a, a motion to uh, get the status of a world heritage uh, for premium cigars. 
um, with UNESCO. Uh, and th there were some attempts in, in, in the, I think in Honduras, uh, at least it's, it's called the World Heritage, <clears throat> the producing of the premium cigar. But none of the countries, Dominican, uh, Cuba, um, Nicaragua, you name it, uh, followed anything through with, with that motion. I think it would have been pretty easy for politicians to get the status of a, of a uh, cultural heritage for the premium uh, cigar with UNESCO. And we would have been, we would have got rid of all the problems. Uh, but for whatever reasons, no, they didn't follow through. Uh, I, I, I thought back then, that was what, five, six years ago, uh, it would have been a pretty easy task, not easy task, but, but a pretty logic task uh, to try to get that status for the premium cigar. But it didn't happen. Look, there's one thing that, uh, that uh, Ian is asking about the FDA uh, worrying about the workers in Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, or Honduras. Uh, uh, maybe they are not worried about that, but they should. You know? Because one of the problems that, uh, uh, that the cigar industry is having now after the pandemic is uh, that the immigration of the, of the rollers to the United States and uh, uh, immigration uh, is is normal. It's natural in in people. They they nobody wants to leave their home, but they need it to to look for for a better life in in another country to for new opportunities. But of course, this is very controversial in all in the countries that receive the the, the, the immigrants. And one way of stopping the immigration is. Um, of course, uh, making uh, these people, uh, making them easier to, to earn their life in their countries of origin. Uh, that's, that's a way. So maybe they don't care about the workers, but, but they should. They should because uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's one thing that all the producers are saying these days, these, these last months, that there's a, a big immigration from Nicaragua, from the Dominican Republic, the rollers that leave all to, to go and live uh, to the United States. So uh, the, the solution is not, uh, sometimes is, is, is uh, help, uh, help uh, producing richness in the countries of origin. Listen, talking about that, it reminds me when we were dealing with that ship in 2010, that we would go and try to meet as much senators and congressmen as possible. And we were always in groups of three or four. And I was always the person in charge that would talk about the impact it would have. And I remember talking, I don't know, it was with Marco Rubio, I can't remember, a long time ago. And I said, what, what the government doesn't understand, at that time they wanted, to, Eship wanted it to be the scars was $10, as you remember that. I said, it becomes a national security issue. And a lot of senators and chief of staff said, explain that to me. And I said, look, it's very easy. Between Nicaragua, Honduras, Mexico, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Brazil, you have easily three or 400,000 people. Those people don't have HBO, so the families are an average of five. So you're putting two plus million people in the poorhouse. And you know where those people are gonna come? They're gonna find a way to come here to the United States. A lot of them are just gonna come in for work, but a lot of them, you don't even know what it is. And I saw the question, and to be honest, they don't care because the government has their own problems. And the situation in DR, to be honest, is not that bad because it's an island and it's hard for them to go to Miami. But from Nicaragua, we've heard it from various people that Reinhardt has had on his show interview and, and we've had him also, that have said that 
Every week there's busloads of people from Leon, from Esteli, from Jalapa, from Ometepe, but not only rollers, the farmers and the women that are stripping that are going directly to the States for 3,000 or 3,500. They don't stop them in Mexico anymore. And when they drop them on the border, they tell them that's the hole you got to go there. They'll be waiting for you and you have a job right away. So that's one of the other things that's affecting basically Nicaragua more than anything else. It's the exodus of labor in the farms and the factories and, and all over. That also is a big problem. We, we spoke uh, a lot about the manufacturing aspect and um, the, the regulatory issues that the industry is facing. Uh, I, I would like to shed some light on, on, on a few other aspects um, of where we are as an industry. And obviously the, the evolutions um, that, that came through the COVID-19 pandemic have um, dramatically reinforced everything that's going on with digitalization, people moving online, um, people moving direct to consumer. Javier, a little earlier, you mentioned the issues that the retail community is facing um, with, uh, with the supply being under such heavy stress. Um, when, when, when you three all look at, um, at the retail perspective uh, or importation and distribution on a more holistic level, um, A, how difficult has the situation truly become there in terms of supply and demand? And then also, what do you see happening with that, uh, that general trend towards direct to consumer? Steve Newman uh, a bit earlier on Facebook mentioned, uh, you know, all these uh, new subscription services. And, 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 and services where you can in order tasting um, sample packs uh, on a monthly basis. What's your take on, on all that and how that has changed to the, the, the importation, distribution and retail landscape? Well, for me, it's a very good question because I live in a country where we have a monopoly of the state. So the tobacco here is, is um, all, you only can buy tobacco in retail shops and the retail shops are under license. You cannot open a, a shop, tobacco shop. You are not free to do it. You have to have a special permission from the state. And the permission is called by the state. The state say, I want to, buy, I want to open a, a shop in this city, in this, in this hood. And who wants it? And then there's a public um, call and you know this is the way that tobacco is sold in Spain but uh, future is future is here you know it's uh, it's going to be very difficult to stop people when they want to buy tobacco uh, there's a lot of people in Spain young people buying tobacco by the internet which is forbidden is forbidden and uh, they prefer to to risk to 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 risk uh, to lose the tobaccos in the in the in the border, they, they can do it. We we Ray Hall and I we had a, a very funny experience last year <laughs> with cigars. You you know Ray Hall, yeah? you know what I mean. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, but but the, you cannot stop this. You cannot do it uh, if you have a retail shop. Then uh, you you you. We have 13,000 retail shops here in Spain, maybe dedicated to cigars, to premium cigars only, two or 300 shops only. But uh, it's, for them, it's going to be very difficult to compete with this because I see my, I see my children. I have, a, I have a boy 21 years old and they, they do everything with a cell phone, everything. And, um, and my daughter too. So that this is the future and the future is, is, is come to stay and uh, everyone should adapt to, to the new conditions of the market if they, they want to, to stay uh, playing their part. Uh, it's the way I, I see it. And, and, and we, we have an expression in Spanish, I don't know if it's, it's uh, very good to translate, that you cannot uh, close doors in the countryside. You cannot do it, and uh, young people are unstoppable with with the internet and with the social media, and there's a lot of companies uh, here in Europe. I, I know in the United States is like that because I visited 
Cigars International, you know, I, I stayed I, I stayed for quarter of or an hour in that warehouse with 90 million sticks there. 90 million sticks is six times the Spanish market. <laughs> and uh, I know how it works in the United States, but in Europe it's not the same. Uh, but I think this is the future. This is what is going to come uh, sooner or later to, to, to the European market. And uh, I, I, I don't think that they are, are going to be able to stop it. I don't know if Jose and Reich are, are agree with me, but. Look, the way I see it, and I've had the uh, opportunity, you know, for years uh, to work in Europe and now more than ever. But if you look in the United States, it's estimated that out of every 100 boxes that come into the States, 30 are sold online. But still the online, the, 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 the brick and mortar shops are, are still uh, doing good. Uh, I think somebody brought up about selling to consumers. I gotta tell you, I, I'm not gonna name companies that do it because I know our company doesn't do it. I'm totally against that. You can't have it both ways. How do you want a retailer to support you when you have a website where you're selling directly to consumers? I think it's unfair, it's unprofessional, it's unethical. And to be honest, me as a consumer, a cigar consumer, would never support a company that sells to a consumers directly. You can't have it both ways, or you're with God or you're with the devil. Now, in Europe, we have a lot of countries where internet sales is totally uh, pro prohibited, but you have a lot of countries that the internet sales, uh, uh, you, you can sell it. I don't think personally with the anti-tobacco movement that any government would be more inclined to let the internet sales of cigars go through where many countries are already, it's prohibited. And the ones that have it still, I would say, I would think the governments would try to really uh, not allow it. Uh, that's, that's the way I think it. I see it in a, in a totally different way. No, Jose, you know, I, I, as a cigar smoker, as Javier Blanco, a cigar smoker, I love going to the shop. Me too. And I think it's part of the enjoyment to go to the shop, to see all the cigars, to see options, to choose, to smell, to smell the, 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 the humidor. You know, I, I love that. Um, but I think that uh, there's a lot of people that uh, doesn't care. They want to buy the cigars and they, they want to have it at home. And for them, it's easier to do it with the cell phone. And uh, we, 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 we can educate people uh, and at the same time, the retail shops have to be able to give that service that I love and that you love, that in the United States is possible because you can go to Neptune Cigars and you can sit there, you can have a, you can have a drink, you can, you can smoke your cigar, you can, but that is not possible in, in most of the places in, in Europe. It's not possible because you cannot smoke in a cigar shop. You know, it's, I think, Sometimes when I think about this, I think it's funny. It's like uh, prohibiting eating in a restaurant, but uh, that's true. In Spain, you cannot smoke in a cigar shop. And if you cannot give that service, at the end, uh, a guy that is sitting in his uh, little city in the north of Spain that want to smoke, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Arturo Fuente, and his shop hasn't the cigar that he wants to try, at the end, He's going to take the cell phone and he's going to buy it by the internet. And uh, I find it uh, logical. I, I mean, I prefer going to the shop like you. I prefer going to them. Most of the retailers in Spain are very close friends. I, I love seeing them, talking with them, having a coffee, smoke with them. I love their, their job. I, you know, I always um, um, encourage them, help them. Uh, as much as I can, but uh, I think that future is to adapt to the new conditions of the market. And one thing very important is that, that tool that came to, to change our lives, that is the internet. Yeah. And things are very different now. Listen, I don't have a problem people buying online. I'm not a fan. 
What I want to clarify that I don't agree with a company selling directly to consumer. That's my point. Reinhold? Uh, no, I agree with you. Um, I, I dislike companies selling to, to the consumers directly. Nothing beats the experience of going to a brick and mortar shop. Nothing at all. And uh, usually it's a place, even though in Europe, you're not allowed in Spain to smoke and you're not allowed in several other countries to enjoy a cigar. But uh, in, in many uh, countries, you, you, you still can do that and nothing beats that experience. Uh, it's like buying, I don't know, Louis Vuitton over the internet. Who, which, which woman does that? I, I, I don't know. In, in Vienna here, they're standing in line to get in, in, into the shop. Uh, and uh, and I would love to see the same thing for the brick and mortar tobacconists, uh, rather than with the with the luxury whatever handbags. Um, I support brick and mortar. Uh, I support manufacturers that are not going uh, online and and selling their product uh, directed to consumers. I understand that. Uh, in, in rural areas uh, or remote areas, it is necessary to, uh, to order over the internet. Um, but uh, if not necessary, then I wouldn't do it, wouldn't recommend it. Um, the, the other thing is that I want to mention when it comes, for instance, to Cuban cigars. Cuban cigars, still a lot of people buy Cuban cigars over the internet, but uh, we know we all know how fishy this is. Uh, even in, in, in shops, it's you're not safe um, getting getting counterfeited cigars and stuff like that. Um, and I know that the retail business in Europe is hurting tremendously because there's no, uh, no supply. Uh, people are asking for their favorite cigars and they're not there. Uh, so they probably go to the internet. Um, and uh, for me, it's an unfortunate, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, I strongly believe in the competent uh, service oriented brick and mortar store uh, where you can spend time, exchange ideas, have, meet new friends, meet old friends, uh, and, and have a good time. That's, I'm old school. I think what it ultimately comes down to is uh, the experience that, that you can have at those locations. And um, I'm not saying that uh, the experience could not be had um, through virtual means either, but um, of course um, it's it's unbeatable to, to go to, to a traditional brick and mortar store and have that experience as long as that experience truly is up to par and that the retail community can make sure to provide excellence and, and service that is truly up to scratch. You know, uh, Reinhardt, the funny thing is that, and you don't see that in Europe, <laughs> We see it in the States a lot. It's the guy that buys um, XYZ online cigar. Then he goes to the cigar shop, drinks the coffee, drinks the water, uh, takes the seat on for four or five hours uh, with a $3 cigar he bought online. And then he gets mad when the store owner doesn't want him in. So the thing is, I've always said, okay, do you buy a six pack in the supermarket and bring it to a bar? Or do you buy a, a piece of meat in a steak place and bring it to a restaurant and have it cooked? You can't have it both ways. Look, if you buy online, there are circumstances of people that live at distance and things like that. I understand. It. But you cannot expect to buy online and a shop is gonna let you sit there, drink the coffee, and take the chair of a guy who could spend 20 or $30 in the day. You can't have it both ways. 
So, I mean, it is what it is. Thank God in, in Europe, uh, you know, you guys uh, don't have to deal with that. But the store owners in the States, they have to deal with that all day long. People, it's like I tell people, okay, you buy online. Well, okay, have the cigar or have the coffee with the guy who sold it to you online. Or just, you know, go to your house and, you know, smoke by yourself. But you can't expect that a shop is going to allow you to come in there, you know, go to an event, be there with everybody, and, 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 and you know, you enjoy the shop. No. I'm a big supporter of brick and mortar because that's when you really get a taste of what the cigar world is. It doesn't matter if it's in New York or in Shanghai or in Thailand or in Santiago or in Austria or in Germany. It doesn't matter. A cigar shop is a cigar shop. There is no comparison like that. In Madrid. Madrid too. In Madrid, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're waiting for you here, Jose. Yeah, I'll yeah, go. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, for me, there is. I, I told. I told you. Uh, for me, it's part of the experience to go to a brick and mortar and, and buy my cigars and choose them and go around and look and see what's new, see what's old. That is very important in our in our industry. What's old? People go into the shop and say, "What's new? What's new?" And I say, "No, no. Ask what's old. That's that 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 be much better." Um, and you know, I, I love. I love and I think it's part of the experience of, of a smoke a cigar. And of course, we can we can educate uh, people on doing this and understand that 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 choose the cigar is part of the enjoyment, that the the packaging, the pack you can you cannot smoke the packaging, but it's very important in the final experience. Nothing like opening an, a brand new box. Uh, that you have just bought, put it on inside your the table of your dining room and open it very slowly to 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 catch the first smell of the of the box, and you know that there's a lot of things. But and I think from the from from our part from from cigar journal, uh, we are making a very good job doing this uh, with a cigar friendly section and showing people what about the shops and the brick and mortar. And that, that this is, of course, this is very important, but uh, shops uh, have to find the, the way uh, to, to, to combine this with the e-commerce because, uh, you know, you cannot stop this. Amazon is now one of the biggest companies in the world. And of course, it's uh, uh, not good for the, for the, 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 the shops in the in the little villages and yeah but but the, you know it's, it's difficult to, to stop this i think brian julian our dear friend from la had a very interesting comment on that and i, I wanted to to share his opinion and, and get brian involved to to learn about his perspective on this Oh yeah, th thank you, Reinhardt. I wanted to jump in. I just, uh, it sounds like maybe just a, kind of a, a semantics issue among family here. I think um, I just wanted to, to uh, differentiate and, and delineate the two things. So like I order online, but it's from a shop in Philadelphia, B&B International, they have a brick and mortar. I think that's a very big different thing than what Jose is saying, right? Where you're going to the cigar company's website and buying directly from them. These are These are two different things in my mind, right? Yes. And then maybe what's, what's also interesting, I mean, there's there's big players and big companies out there that um, have, have gone down the road of uh, direct to consumer for a long time. Um, and they even operate their, their own retail shops in, in certain cities and countries. Do you see it differently there? Um, if it's a sort of a, a large, well-established player who's uh, in the manufacturing space, in the retail space, in the online business, does that make any difference? <laughs> Look, that's a <laughs> that's a touchy subject because uh, uh, the big the big two have uh, one company has thirty shops and a huge uh, right arm on the internet business. Then you have the other company that has these mega stores 
and they're planning to make five or six other big ones. And they're the biggest uh, internet company in the world. So it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit different because they have, they want you to buy the cigar, have it in your shop, but then they want to compete with you selling to your consumers on their site. And on top of that, then they also have a shop that compete with you. So it's like, you know, it's like three guys beating up one guy. So, you know, I'm not going to mention companies, but everybody knows who these big two, uh, two players are. But even with that said, those two companies do not sell directly to uh, to consumer. There's a company we know which it is, very prestigious company, that even us as manufacturers, as uh, just cigar people wonder, why would they do that? When they're so prestigious, such a big company, and they have been questioned by consumers, questioned by their colleagues, questioned by store owners, why have to sell directly to consumers? I'm totally against selling to consumers. Uh, I'm a big fan of brick and mortar. That's what I've done all my life, supported brick and mortar. And I'm glad that the company I work with is, is a huge supporter of brick and mortar. For me, if I can jump in, um, for, for me, it's a no-go for a manufacturer to sell directly to the consumer. Um, shouldn't be done. Um, I, I dislike it. Uh, I can see, and Brian mentioned that um, if you have a cigar shop that also sells uh, online, I'm fine with that. Uh, I dislike the online only uh, companies and uh, very much in questions in question are the those giants that are trying to put all the brick brick and mortar stores out of business because they have those giant uh, warehouses uh, and otherwise do their business online only. Um, I dislike it also. Uh, we should all make a point to go to our local brick and mortar and have a good time. That's my opinion. Amen. Um, let's look into the future be, before we come to the end of our show for today. Um, what do you gentlemen think will be the driving forces and the defining factors for the entire premium cigar industry moving forward over the next nine months? Listen, you know, when I was young, because remember one time I was young, you would always hear people say, that's the $64,000 question. <laughs> But now I would say it's a $64 million question. <laughs> There's so many aspects that we have to look towards the next nine months. Whether we like it or not, what's happening between our brothers in Ukraine with the Russians, that has a big impact, has a huge impact on oil, has a huge impact, of course, of transportation. Whether we uh, can hit 456 million, if I were to be a betting man in Vegas, would have a bet, I would say the United States will not import 450 million cigars. If I were to predict now, I would say maybe 420, 425, because first of all, because I think consumption, if the cost of living and inflation keeps going up, uh, the, you have to eat, you have to use gas, uh, you know, you, you have to pay your bills. I mean, uh, vices get, not vices, uh, cigars will get cut out and maybe a bottle of whiskey. Uh, the situation of COVID, that has a lot to do. We're waiting to see how the summer goes. There's people already saying they will have the fifth, sixth, seventh, whatever wave it is. September, everybody coming back from the holidays. But what I think worries me the most, again, is the quality issue. People cutting corners, 
cigars. We've had a lot of people say in tunneling, canoeing, side burning, a lot of ammonias. And it's not from the reputable company. It's from some middle-sized companies that are doing pretty good, have been doing good. But all of a sudden, they have such a demand, and that's where they're going to get hurt. Other than that, virtues will continue. Serious cigar media will grow more every day. A lot of wannabes have been falling off like flies, hitting by raid. And I think that people like Coop and Cigar Journal and Cigar Aficionado and Light Them Up, and the people who are doing a great job will help more people fall more in love with cigars. So that's my the way I see uh, it'll be a good year, but to me, it, uh, it can have some big question marks at the end of the year. For me, the key is um, are, the, are the forecast, as I said in the beginning. One thing, uh, Jose, you are still young because <laughs> we, we are young from the heart, you know? <laughs> but uh, I think the, the, key is, the key for the future is still the forecast, as I said in the beginning, because the decisions in the in that the industry are taking now are not for next nine months, it's are for two or three years. So it's very... You, you have to be very um, very good making this forecast of what is going to happen with the demand. But of course, uh, quality is the key. Do, do, uh, if, I, if I had to make these decisions in the industry, I wouldn't be crazy to cover the demand that, that is so big, but be crazy for uh, making quality cigars, although you, you don't Uh, arrive to all the people that is demanding your cigar. This is one thing that Lito Gomez uh, told me in an interview that I made him about Andalusian Bull. The, the, I think it's his, his very great cigar that was uh, uh, the, is the, 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 his very premium cigar, yeah? the Andalusian Bull, La Flor Dominicana Andalusian Bull. And uh, there was a there was a lack of Andalusian bull in the market in Spain. And I asked him about this and he said, I only make Andalusian bull if I have the tobacco to make and to assure that the blend is authentic Andalusian bull. Uh, if I have the tobacco, I made the cigar. If I don't have the tobacco, I'm not making the cigar. And for me, that's honest and good job. Care about the quality, care about the brand and uh, not becoming crazy because of success because um, if uh, you produce more than you more than you can sustain in the in time uh, maybe it's going to be uh, not so good for your brand not so good for your quality and not so good for your future so for me the key is the forecast and to maintain as uh, jose has said and to maintain quality uh, i agree with both of you Quality is the issue. Um, I have no doubts of uh, about the success of the premium brands. Flor Dominicana, Fuente, Padron, Padomo. They all know that uh, you cannot rush the heads of time. And if something is not there, you cannot produce it in a, in a certain quality. I have no question and no doubts about the success of those brands. Uh, whoever is serious in the tobacco industry, in the premium cigar industry, will survive. Numbers, I agree with you, Jose, uh, will go down. I said at the beginning, what comes up will go down. Um, I think that was uh, um, due to the effect of COVID. Um, and uh, the question is, of course, how far and how fast will go down and who will be affected. None of the premium cigar makers will be affected, I am sure. Uh, I'm sure that, that all of the people here in the show on Facebook, uh, they know what they like uh, and there might be others that cut their corners in their palate 
or in their budget, whatever, uh, and, and they're able and willing to smoke cheaper cigars, not as good cigars. Uh, it's okay, that happens all the time. But uh, for the premium cigar industry, I'm not worried. Unless, at least, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, price increases and stuff like that, legislation, regulation, and, and over-regulation is a different thing. We'll have to think about that. Over to Riot, our brother in Dubai. Good to see you, my friend. Hey, everyone. Well. Good to see everybody. Um, I just, I just wanted to add something. Obviously, what the three gentlemen mentioned is quite correct and quite true. Uh, I have further concerns, in my humble opinion, that would impact the industry as a whole. And obviously, I speak from a distributor or a, from a brick and mortar point of view. Um, governmental regulations, I think, are going to be even stricter and stricter, especially, I would say, in our part of the world. Uh, taxes will continue to grow and uh, the whole importation process is going to continue to be very difficult for reasons that are unclear uh, and they're more difficult for brick and mortar than for people to order online, ironically enough. Uh, so people that order online have a 50-50 chance of having their stuff going in without paying any taxes. 90% of the people actually take that chance and, and, and do the ordering online. Uh, the other concern that I have is that crypto is going to seek, slowly seep into the industry as a whole. Uh, we've had a very interesting, uh, and obviously I think it's very creative what they've done. I'm not saying this in a negative way, but uh, you were just talking about, about uh, uh, Andalusian Bull and LFD. LFD just released something about how... Uh, a certain type of cigar, the new actually under the CM Bull, the new format of the under the CM Bull is going to be uh, made available only for seven people that are going to do an auction of an NFT of the cigar itself. And so these are the people that will have the, uh, 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 the right to buy those cigars on a monthly basis. That in itself is going to create some kind of a quasi monopoly for a certain kind of a cigar. So, and, and for people that don't have access to crypto or that have not entered the crypto market, this becomes a bit difficult. Um, the third concern that I have uh, is, is online business for brick and mortar is a headache when the market is up because they can offer prices and offer discounts that brick and mortar cannot offer because their prices are a third or even, you know, 25% of what brick and mortar pay. Uh, the worst part, however, is should the market collapse or for whatever reason, there's some kind of an oversupply, which might happen because producers now are trying to produce to catch up and all of that stuff, or should the market turn around, online are going to be dumping a lot of cigars in the market. Uh, and that's going to impact the prices that are going to happen. I don't want to sound like I'm kind of reflecting on a doomsday kind of thing, but these are some of the concerns that I keep in mind whenever I'm budgeting and planning and looking at the next six to 12 months and, and, and how I'm gonna treat my own stock when it comes to these things. Just thought I'd share these things with you. But, but let me, let me uh, you made a point and unfortunately we have to go back to the boom. You have 418 million cigars in 97, the 98, it went down by 23%. In 99, it went down by 26%. So if you look at the numbers, between 98 and 99, we lost almost 50% of the imports. But where did all those cigars go to? Lou Rothman, Mark Goldman, and a series of people were sitting in Santiago buying those cigars at 20 and 25 cents on the dollar. That's what I'm afraid of that will happen now. And to be honest, if you look at two brands that we always mention, when did Padron grow after the boom? When did Fuente really grow? It was after the boom. Why? And there was other companies because they kept up the consistency. They kept up with the quality. And people realized that while everybody was selling cigars for 10, 12, $15, dollars. 
Padrón and Fuente was selling cigars seven, eight, nine, ten dollars with consistency and quality all the time. Take my word. You will see this in 2023. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cigars being dumped on CI, Famous, Best Buy, and all that because history will repeat itself. People are playing around to make a quick buck. More than 150 million cigars were sold at 20 and 25%, 20 or 25 cents on the dollar. And it will happen again if people continue to cut corners. I hear you. I hear you. Well, Jose, that's why you know, I said, Jose, that the important thing is the forecast. You know? uh, that's the important thing. But one thing that, that uh, Red said, you know, uh, uh, we, of course, we are all very worried about regulations. And uh, of course, that is a big challenge in the industry, but it's not new. It's for the last 30 years, we, we've seen how the regulations are worse and worse and uh, they advance. But one thing that is happening, at least in Spain, mm -hmm. is that cigar smokers are organizing themselves to make their own clubs, private clubs, to make their, their, mm -hmm. their to, to find their own space of freedom for consume. And that's one thing that is happening more and more here in Spain. So <clears throat> I think that the, uh, and the, the regulations are, of course, a, a big problem, and the taxes are a big problem that comes from from long from long ago. But at the end, the the water flows. You know, uh, it's, it's going to be <laughs> very difficult if uh, an adult uh, person is decided to smoke a premium cigar. Doesn't matter. The it doesn't matter. He will find the he will find the place. So of course, it's a problem. It's a challenge. That uh, not for the next nine months. It comes from 30 years ago, and uh, you know, just because if not, we we can go to <laughs> to close everything and look for work in another kind of industry. I, I want to look to the future with a, in an optimistic way that at the end consumers find the find their way to smoke a good cigar. I, I, I it doesn't matter the the prohibitions and the regulations. Or not so, not it doesn't matter so much. Sorry, Rafael. No, 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 <laughs> not at all, Javier. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for your tremendous questions. Uh, brilliant to see so many people watching us on Facebook, um, all the engagement, all the wonderful questions that you shared. It's greatly appreciated. Um, Jose, there's, there's this old saying that um, history probably doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. And as we stated at the beginning, um, one thing's for sure, we can and we have to certainly learn from the past, learn from the mistakes and move on as a global cigar community, as a unity and as a very strong industry and, and strong ecosystem. And I hope that uh, shows like... Uh, our expert panel today can help everybody to, to better understand, to, to learn a little more about the ins and outs and the behind the scenes of the cigar industry so that we can all move forward, make educated decisions and clearly speak with one voice and uh, strengthen the unity of this wonderful ecosystem. I would love to thank all of you for uh, your contribution today, being part of this uh, wonderful show. Uh, next week, we will host um, the Sotil Global Movement, and we will shed some light on this wonderful new platform and initiative coming from Anastasia and her wonderful team and Lefty. We will have both Anastasia and Lefty on the show. I have to confess, though, for all of you joining us here via Zoom on the regular lounge for technical reasons, unfortunately, next week, as one exemption, we won't be able to go live here via Zoom, and we will only go live on Facebook. So please, for all of you regulars here at the lounge, join us on Facebook next week. And then in two weeks time from now, we'll definitely be back here live via Zoom and Facebook. And if you haven't seen it, um, we also have a YouTube channel where we um, publish all our 
full episodes and all the records of the live show. So in case you missed one, jump over to the Light 'em Up World YouTube channel and you can find all our previous shows for rewatch. And obviously they're on Facebook as well. But um, back to you three gentlemen. One final word, um, one final message to the world out there before we close the show. And again, many thanks to all of you, Jose Blanco, Javier and Reinhold for your wonderful contribution today. Uh, I'll put it this way. To me, uh, I think that uh, we can accomplish a lot if we all put our thoughts together. I think we have some of the greatest minds industry-wise uh, making cigars today, people who are passionate. But this can only be achieved if we all are under one voice one message, one mission, one commitment. The commitment to preserve this industry that has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years and that will continue for many years. And even though I dislike having to repeat it again and again, remember those who brought us to the dance. Because it really breaks my heart to see all these people saying, out with the old and in with the new. And what I tell them is, if it wasn't for all of us, the old guys, and the older guys that were before us, and the older guys that were before them, we would not be smoking today. We would not have this beautiful panel today. We wouldn't have wonderful magazines and cigar media people like we have. So I'm for innovation, I'm for the young, but you cannot have it without the old. My two cents. Amen, Jose. I, I have to say, uh, of course I, I agree with everything that Jose Blanco says because uh, he's my uncle. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I have a lot of respect for that. And uh, of all the things that we have said tonight, uh, for me, the, the key sentence is the best is, just, is yet to come. So uh, future is not so black. I think the uh, future will, will bring new challenges, new troubles, but new opportunities too for people that want to work and want to make good things. So for me, the conclusion should be this to to, to finish in a, you know, in a good way, in a, with good vibes is the, the best is yet to come. I agree with that, Jose, and I hope it, it will be like that. I agree with both of you. I'm very optimistic. Uh, I think cigars are here to stay. Uh, enjoyment is here to stay. And among this group, I think everything's clear. We love this industry. We support this industry. We support every corner of it. And we, as consumers, we don't cut corners to online or e-commerce or whatever. Um, we know what is important. And uh, let's keep it up. Let's light them up. Why not thank you, it was a great show. Brilliant. Thank you very much for Mard. It's a wrap for today. Uh, we'll be back with uh, our expert panel and with our quarterly reviews of what's happening in the industry. And uh, for today, thank you all. Light them up and we'll see you all again next week via Facebook and then in two weeks time, both via Zoom and Facebook. Mm -hmm.